Welcome to Millican Healthcare Compression Training Academy, a series of educational modules intended for healthcare professionals caring for patients with venous leg ulcers and complications of the lower limb who require compression therapy. Welcome to Module 6, Clinical Evidence and Evaluations in Compression Therapy. This module will focus on the importance and impact of clinical evidence on our practice today. We will explore the history of clinical evidence, how evidence is generated, ranked and used in wound care and compression therapy today. Finally, how you can become involved in adding to the body of evidence to support this area of practice and how to access the support available. Clinical Evidence and Clinical Evaluations in Compression Therapy. This module will explore an introduction to leg ulcers. We will recap the size and cost of the leg ulcer problem globally, which underpins the desire for best clinicums for both the patient and the healthcare provider. Evidence. We will look at the World Union of Wound Healing Society's International Position Document their statements relating to the subject area and recommendations for levels of clinical evidence. Translating evidence into clinical practice, we will take a look at the history of clinical evidence use in practice, how safety has raised the bar and how we translate evidence and research into our everyday practice. Hierarchy of evidence, we will look at the different levels and types of clips of clinical evidence the importance and weight of each and at what stages they may add to the body of evidence and why sometimes the need for one type of evidence may be more critical to an innovation or practice change. Appraisal of the clinical evidence, the importance of knowing the value of evidence and how to access, critique and appraise the published literature to establish its true value or weight of the evidence for practice and to identify gaps for future work to be explored. Evidence types and examples. We will look at some published examples of different types of evidence in leg ulcers and compression and how these can drive clinical decision making. Call to action, getting involved, we will explore some opportunities that may be available to you and how you can access support to undertake clinic, clinical evaluations or higher level studies. Resources and support available, we will look at some examples of support already given to clinical teams around the globe. In preparing this presentation, we have used and relied upon information from public sources on the web. We therefore make no warranty expressed or implied as to the accuracy or completeness of the underlying assumptions, estimates, data or other information not generated by Millikan. Compression therapy is considered gold standard treatment for the management of chronic venous insufficiency, venous reflux and associated conditions including edema, venous leg ulceration and skin conditions such as venous eczema. The goal of compression therapy is to support the underlying venous system and structures, aid venous competence to improve venous return, reduce limb edema, decrease pain and increase leg ulcer healing rate. Compression therapy will be required for life to prevent chronic venous insufficiency and symptoms of venous reflux from recurring. Module 1 of this education series contains in-depth information on the causes of chronic venous insufficiency, the venous system and its structures, the veins, the valve half muscle pump. Venous leg ulcers are a global healthcare challenge. The United Kingdom estimates prevalence between 0.1 and 0.3%. 
the United States of America approximately 1.69%, with similar prevalence rates reported in parts of Europe. The annual cost of managing confirmed venous leg ulcers in the United Kingdom is reported to be between 500 and 900 million pounds. The United States of America estimate annual costs between 2.5 and 3.5 billion dollars and are consistent with European estimates with Germany reporting cost to treat at between 9,900 and 10,800 euros. These figures continue to be challenged. Erwin et al. in 2022 report lower costs in the United Kingdom through continual prevalence and reporting methodologies. The cost to the individual patient and impact on their quality of life is impossible to measure. Recurrence rates are reported to be between 26 and 69% at 12 months post-healing. There are a plethora of evidence-based policies and guidelines available which have been designed to establish a global consensus approach toward leg ulcer management and selection of compression therapy, including the International Advisory Panel for Compression, who published a pathway cited in the European Wound Management Association compression documents. Clinical Evidence and Evaluations The International Position Document by the World Union of Wound Healing Societies Let us look at the World Union of Wound Healing Societies statement on evidence in wound care. Wound management research improved clinical outcomes by standardising assessment, planning and implementation of treatment. In the field of wound care, high-level evidence is possible but it can be difficult to conduct due to the wide range in nature of wounds and patients. Additionally, there is an ever-growing variety of products and devices available to practitioners to improve healing rates and patient outcomes. In many cases, these products have enabled practitioners to heal more complex wounds and manage more challenging and difficult cases. However, Practitioners must be able to critically appraise evidence to make appropriate and effective evidence-based changes to their practice. We will explore how the use of clinical evidence has evolved and how focus on the critical appraisal of the evidence to make, to make appropriate and effective evidence-based changes within clinical practice relating to general practice tools and policies to exploring and implementing new products and technologies to improve wound care. It is important to note that there has been huge focus on level 1F1 evidence in wound care. However, as we explore further, we will consider how varied levels of evidence combined also contribute to the bigger picture and real-world evidence base for practice. Until the early 1990s, clinical practice was based upon tradition, clinical training methods, clinical techniques used and commonly this was accepted as this is how we do it with very little questioning or reasoning for over the next three decades the move towards evidence-based practice has exploded through the growth of research base and arguably through the academic evolution of medical nurse training to degree and postgraduate level. Today we centre all aspects of the care we deliver, the materials and devices we use on an agreed level of evidence base. New innovations, materials and devices have to achieve a robust minimum evidence base to achieve their approvals and registrations. When these products then arrive in clinical practice, we need to translate this evidence into our own practice setting to underpin our clinical decision and policy making and even further grow the evidence where gaps remain to underpin certain aspects of our own clinical care setting.
These may include additional patient safety studies or evaluations specific to a patient group or care setting to standardise care across a variety of care settings, to monitor specific clinical effectiveness, the best patient outcomes, if meeting or in or exceeding current gold standard, to explore cost effectiveness, the best use of resources and budget additional costs or cost savings, to support the further development, implementation and cascade of the use of new clinical tools and resources, to explore new innovations, ensuring practice evolution, implement new innovations, for example, strategies for the safe, swift and effective implementation of a new tool, device or material shared via published implementation literature. Evidence-based practice. So what is it? There are many ways we use clinical evidence to support our clinical practice. Consensus and position documents. This is an area of rapid growth via global experts and organisations with an overall aim to gain consensus of practice, diagnosis, care, product selection for specific specialities or devices. We have already alluded to the World Union of Wound Healing Society's position document for evidence in wound care. I would highly recommend that you download and familiarise yourself with this. Also, the compression position document is an excellent example. UMA, or the European Wound Management Association, have been striving for almost a decade to achieve this consensus. This now includes the International Compression Recommendations Pathway, which we have explored in earlier modules in this series. It is through the collaboration of global experts, the review of global evidence, that these documents are underpinned and developed. Policy and and Guideline Development Firstly, let us look at the higher level guideline development. This may be through an organisation such as in the UK, NICE or the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. At national level, the research available will be reviewed by experts and a national guideline will be developed and issued to become the standard to follow in clinical practice. These national guidelines then become the basis for policy developments, which may be regional or even local. We must remember that guidelines are a, gu- are a guide to be followed based on best available evidence, whilst policies are to be adhered to based upon attention to guidelines, whilst considering regional and local generated evidence and or the setting. Clinical evidence is critical to underpin both of these. Assessment tools and validation. I am sure that we can all think of tools that have been developed within our area of expertise, whether that be a pressure ulcer, a leg ulcer, diabetic foot ulcer related tool, a skin assessment tool or a pain tool. There is a plethora of tools out there. We also need to be looking for the evidence which validates these tools as well as the development evidence or we need to be seeking to embark on clinical evidence to explore their validation. Way development. Most countries globally have now developed care pathways for each speciality or procedure to aid care delivery and provide consistent safe care. All of these will be or need to be underpinned by some level of clinical level of clinical evidence. Procedure optimization. The saying, if we always do what we've always done, we will always have what we've always had. Clinical evidence helps us to drive our practice. There are many examples one could for this. Possibly one of the simplest examples related to leg ulcer care is that of the switch to cleaning using tap water, now recommended and implemented in many countries. 
Some countries, however, are now exploring if the raise in pseudomonal wound infection is related to or correlates with this. If this is found to be the case, it may reverse the evidence to use tap water. Firstly, it is not uncommon for some evidence to contradict another piece of evidence. This is where our thorough understanding of critique comes in, which we will look at shortly. The reality is that evidence and practice is a lifelong relationship and the more we explore, the more we understand, the more we can change and improve and explore further. Some of the best researchers, such as Professor Hugo Parch, has conducted research which he states invalidates his previous research. He had access to better research tools and methods and was able to explore and understand more. Research does not stand still. Product and ice innovations. We will look shortly at some of the evidence companies are required by law to undertake before approvals or registrations are granted to bring their products to clinical level. Often, it is at the stage that the clinician is engaged and able to work, work with the innovations that their true positioning and value in clinical practice is revealed. Hierarchy of evidence. Not all evidence has the same clinical value or weight. The hierarchy of evidence has been developed to support consistent and clear ranking of the weight with an aim to unify how evidence is used internationally. Here we can see the green bars which identify the levels of evidence for studies on therapy, prevention, etiology and harm as set out in the World Union of Wound Healing Society's Evidence in Wound Care document. Level, level 1 evidence has been divided into three subcategories. Level 1A, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Level 1B, individual randomised controlled trials. And Level 1C, non-randomised controlled trials. Level 2 evidence also has three subcategories. Level 2A, systematic reviews with homogeneity, meaning the quality or state of being are all the same or all of the same kind within cohort studies. Level 2B, 2B, individual cohort studies or low quality randomised controlled trials with those of less than 80% follow up and non-comparative or uncontrolled. Level 2C is outcomes research. Level 3 evidence has two subcategories. Level 3A, systematic reviews, again with homogeneity, of case controlled studies and level 3B, individual case control studies. Level 4 evidence, case series and will also include poor quality cohort and case control studies. Level 5 evidence is expert opinion without explicit appraisal or based on physiology, bench research or first principles. These levels clearly define and give more detailed descriptors to support the ease of evidence ranking. For registrations such as CE or FDA approvals and for tender or formulary potential and is more routinely used by government healthcare establishments globally. You may be more familiar with the alternative representation, the blue pyramid on the other side of the slide, which is the evidence pyramid model. The higher the pyramid, the higher the evidence weight. At the tip of the pyramid, we have randomised controlled trials, then cohort studies, case control studies, case series and case reports being at the base of the pyramid. The World Union of Wound Healing Society's level of evidence has further expanded on each of these categories within the pyramid. 
Many leaders in wound care refer to the barriers to undertaking the higher level evidence in wound care due to variables and underlying disease the wounds are symptoms of. Key opinion leaders in the field have voiced the need for a variety of evidence level value to further understand treatments and practices in wound care. A mixture of evidence types to include randomised control trials, cohort studies, case control studies and case series or case reports to formulate a more realistic picture picture of practice related evidence. As randomised control trials alone will exclude a high percentage of the population through its inclusion and exclusion criteria alone. Hierarchy of evidence. As already mentioned, most of us are more familiar with the pyramid model of the hierarchy of evidence, through which the quality of the evidence will increase from base towards the top. The representation seen here is a good example a product such as a compression bandage will take from pre-launch to post-clinical use. At the base of the pyramid, you can now see laboratory research. As mentioned previously, for any new innovations, there will be additional scientific experiments and studies studies required prior to any human or clinical studies. We will explore these further and look at examples during the next section. Following on from the laboratory research, case studies, case series, cohort studies and randomised control trials will be performed to, performed to provide the higher levels 1 and 2 evidence as we have looked at previously. Product and device evidence journey. Laboratory research, which is non-clinical evidence but in vitro work. In vitro is Latin for within the glass. When something is performed in vitro, it happens outside of a living organism. In vitro will explore the technology properties and behaviour in a laboratory scientific environment to establish competitive analysis, proof of the technology or to secure regulatory approvals for instructions for use. This could relate to sub-bandage pressure measurement in a cylindrical shape test model as we have discussed in previous modules. These types of tests for compression materials aim to provide validity to the products and a quality indicator. For example, we may state this bandage delivers 30 to 40 millimetres of mercury pressure All companies in the field of compression will have data available for their bandage or garment in a test model scenario. You can also request a report that's correlated or data on file. Laboratory research can be investigational studies. This could be looking at a singular product or comparing several products at any one time to compare their physical behaviours. For example, example, different compression bandages could undergo the same test model and the sub-bandage results then be compared. Laboratory tests are used to validate the claims and science behind the product prior to any human exposure. It is important to understand and validate, for example, how many millimetres of mercury pressure will be exerted by the bandage prior to using on a human limb. This is the quality and safety aspect to conduct in the laboratory testing. Tools and methods used are tested for reliability and validity. It is a controlled environment with minimal variables. These conditions will give all compression bandages, for example, a reliable and fair test. These tests do not always translate directly to clinical. A good example of this is the drain pipe or cylindrical device used to measure sub-bandage pressure in the laboratory setting. A drain pipe is not a limb and does not behave like a limb. 
Therefore, the results cannot be directly translated to clinical practice, but they can be used as a benchmark and quality indicator. Product and device evidence journey. The next step is to move on to initial in vivo observation. This is performed or taking place in a living organism. Usually this will firstly be in the form of a healthy volunteer study. Healthy volunteer study numbers may vary significantly depending upon the technology, the level of safety threshold required to pass to gain entry to the next phase of clinical evaluation. Only then will a technology or innovation progress to patient cases. An initial case evaluation may be undertaken with experts within the field of practice. Clinical evaluation will be for proof of concept to observe for general use and outcomes. This process and number of initial trial cases differ between companies, countries and the technology being evaluated. Formal approval is required to undertake initial patient cases, a formal data collection format is required and formal informed patient consent to conduct any clear evidence in human subjects is required. Initial case evaluations are normally observational and used within a specific targeted patient speciality and group. They are non-comparative. They will be first time users of the product and this can also include looking at the mode of delivery, ease of use, packaging feedback and softer marketing appraisal. Ideally, they will capture the expert clinical opinion, advice for future positioning, clinical use and clinical study gaps based, up, based upon their expert experience and learnings from their initial case test. They will help to support future product positioning or new applications. They will also support case series and randomised control trial study designs moving forward, only to use in venous patients or unsuitable for the arterially compromised patient. Does not always result in publication. Very often, initial expert case exploration does not get into the general healthcare domain. It is often used, used when filing for ethical approvals to undertake further studies, one reason being the minimum case information that is collected. More than one facility, data and feedback can be combined into one publication. This further supports the importance of using a formal standardised approach, formal data collection tool to afford the collation of the results and feedback to allow the combining of the data to take place. Product and device evidence journey. The next step will be to undertake a formal approved case series. The laboratory and initial case data and feedback will be critical to conducting the right case series or formal clinical evaluation to observe, record and report specific outcomes identified as areas for exploration via experts' initial evaluations across a higher number of patients. Patient numbers can vary dramatically. However, mo however, most case series will identify a minimum of 15 and aim for around 40 patients. The results from the case series then help to underpin further product positioning, clinical use and training approaches for the future. A case series requires formal data set, ethical approval and informed consent. Quantitative results are sought at this stage, such as progression to healing or healing, edema reduction or slippage. Sometimes comparative at this stage, age, usually compared to current gold standard of care used at the centre conducting the evaluations. 
common endpoints across all patients through a well-designed clinical research framework, focused patient type, and through and through a formal approved inclusion and exclusion criteria. The aim is to achieve superiority or non-inferiority, highlighting the equivalence or better outcomes compared to the current standard of care. Of course, there could always be a result of inferiority, which would result in withdrawal of the case series and the product. Good quality controlled case series are usually published in peer-reviewed journals and impact clinical adoption and use globally. Multi-centre collation via standard research frameworks, ideally multiple centre, will all follow the same standard of care to keep variables to a minimum. Product and device evidence journey. The final step is the investment to high quality focus level one and two research. Many companies invest hundreds of thousands of dollars, euros and pounds, aiming to robustly underpin their innovations and technologies. Randomised controlled trial or high quality cohort. These studies can take several years to complete and usually have a pilot study of 10 to 15 patients to test the research method and data capture process to identify any areas of weakness to afford the researchers time to add or remove from the research framework. The overall size and scope of the patient population is largely driven by statistical requirements. Randomization. This should be undertaken through a recognised, often computer-generated method. Study blinding. It is often difficult to double-blind or blind some studies. For example, compression bandage studies, as the researcher can clearly identify which bandage is which. There are some, some methods that can be deployed to blind, which involve more research involved in each clinical visit. One researcher removing the bandage and a second researcher applying the new bandage. For this reason, often compression studies are not blinded. It should be fully good clinical practice compliant. The protocol ethics and the researcher should hold GCP certification. Globally, the GCP guidelines are active and serve to protect all participants in research and combat research fraud. It should be controlled and this is key to gaining robust clinical evidence. It should be hypothesis driven. For example, I may have a hypothesis of progression to healing or complete healing in group X with product A is better than product B due to X, Y and Z. The research will test my hypothesis. That it should provide statistically valid data. All studies should be statistically powered to ensure the correct number of patients are recruited to demonstrate the difference. Usually published in higher level peer-reviewed journals and may be as a result of funded master's or PhD program. They're usually ongoing and may be completely independent work. Now we have looked at the different levels of clinical evidence, we can explore how we interpret this evidence prior to translation into clinical practice. Appraisal of clinical literature, especially the higher level randomised control trials, which can be very challenging to read. Often an abstract does not give all of the results or context required to review and translate to clinical practice. My personal rule of thumb is always to read an abstract last. The use of critical appraisal frameworks assist us in unpicking the literature systematically to reveal which publications are really robust evidence-based. 
there are several critique tools available. I recommend you search for an appraisal tool that best fits you, your area of practice, area of practice, or perhaps your local research department recommends for you. Safety is always the first consideration we give to any new development and no license or approval to use will be given without this. The next three key areas we are seeking to find information tend to relate to efficacy, effectiveness and economic value. A good appraisal tool will assist us in extrapolating this information from the clinical evidence. It will help to identify bias within published literature and, va and validate good research methodologies. Essentially, before considering any change in practice, we will want to consider efficacy. Can it work? Does the product or intervention do what it is meant to do? Effectiveness, does it work? Does the product or intervention do what it is meant to do as well as or better than what we are currently doing or using? Economic value, is it worth it? Obviously, the patient and outcome benefits will weight this question, but we also need to consider, are there any cost implications? If higher price, do I have sufficient clinical evidence to prove the additional cost is worth it to the healthcare organisation? Can I demonstrate overall outcome cost benefit savings? Before we explore a published example, let's take a slightly more general look at the description of randomised control trials. They are quantitative, often comparative and controlled experiments. Two or more interventions in a series of individuals received in random order. They can be open label, single blind or double blinded. Double blind, the investigator is unaware of intervention under investigation until all the data has been analysed. They are costly to undertake, they are time consuming and larger studies take several years. As I've previously mentioned, they are difficult to blind. Randomise some visible aspects such as the wound, the bandage, the dressing, or even a, even a procedure. Often exclude a large percentage of the population under investigation due to the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Randomised controlled trials are considered to be the most powerful level of evidence. We will now look at a published example of the ACOT study to discuss some elements of advantage and limitation. We must remember that randomised controlled trials usually conclude with more research questions and areas for further study and recommendations than answers to our questions. Here we have an example of a published randomised controlled trial, which is compression with calamine to explore the effect of calamine on skin condition and itch. The advantages of the apricot study is that it is an independent institute of health research, UK government and National Health Service funded and initiated study. It has a robust protocol, a strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. It has full ethics review and approval. It uses validated tools to quantify results, the Pariter scale and the push tool as examples of some of the tools used. It is statistically powered and presented. It is open label, randomised, multi-centre, two-layer compression for chronic venous insufficiency. Overall, an excellent example of a well-constructed and conducted randomised control trial. So what might be some limitations of the apricot study? Light compression was used in this study. It was undertaken, vascular unit, 
and they explored chronic venous insufficiency as well as mixed etiology ulcers. Therefore, were some subjects better suited to full compression rather than light? The standard of care at the centre was a dry version of a competitive two-layer compression and it has been versus a paste version calamine two-layer compression. The results are indicative of the impact on skin condition and a secondary hypothesis has been developed that progression to healing or complete healing is improved in the calamine group. But this was not included as a measurement in the apricot randomised control trial. As previously mentioned, this raised more research questions and a new randomised control trial called PEACH has now been initiated to explore healing as a primary outcome. Both studies would need to be replicated for standard compression as PEACH is also being conducted with light compression. We can therefore extrapolate some clinical evidence from the randomised controlled trials, but there remains a need for further exploration and research. Before we look at some examples of cohort studies, let's just revisit. Cohort studies are longitudinal observational studies which investigate predictive risk factors and health outcomes. They are different from clinical trials in that no intervention, treatment or exposure is administered to the participants before they explore potential effect of an investigation or a suspected risk factor is evaluated. They can be prospective or retrospective and the effect effect of an intervention can then be compared across different groups. Here we have an example of a cohort study in venous leg ulcers. This cohort study explored factors associated with physical activity levels in people with venous leg ulcers and was a prospective cohort. The study found lower activity levels affected healing outcomes. Groups such as diabetics were found to be less active. Groups who were educated on physical activity levels demonstrated better outcomes over time. This cohort study therefore suggests that through the giving of, through the giving of patient education and advice relating to physical exercise, better outcomes will be seen. These study types help to build out the bigger picture, holistic care pathway and interventions. This cohort study explored risk factors aiming to predetermine the factors putting those at risk of developing a first leg ulcer of those with underlying chronic venous insufficiency. Again, this study will potentially contribute to the bigger holistic picture, patient education and care pathway planning as a preventative strategy. Case controlled studies rather than case series or studies. These are studies that compare two groups of people. Those with the disease or condition under study who are the cases and a very similar group of people who do not have the decision who become the controls. These could be a group of people from a certain profession, for example, comparing those with chronic venous insufficiency to those without, aiming to identify factors which may have predisposed the disease process. Is it profession? Is it profession related, excessive standing, flying, driving, or is it not profession related? Before we look at some examples, let's revisit case studies and case series. These are widely used in compression and wound care to provide insights into treatment, management of wound-related conditions and specific interventions. 
A case as a case report is an in-depth or intensive study of a single individual or a specific group. It is important that these cases data is collected in a formal format and approvals and consent are granted. A case series is a grouping of similar case studies or case studies or case reports together to improve the weight of the evidence. These can be conducted via recruiting a large number or through combining and collating several case studies or reports from various centres. Again, this stresses, this stresses the importance for the use of formal data collection formats, approvals and consent is critical to allow the combining. But also we require consent and approvals for the use of future data and images for publication. Case study or report or case series are value clinically as they offer insight and images to cases we may have similar on our own caseloads. Single case reports are normally shared with the wider wound care community via Congress presentations and posters. Limitations are that very little background information is available and often no formal data collection phase has been undertaken. Here we have another example of a case report poster at Congress. The images are indicative of the improvement in the skin condition and therefore of great clinical value. Again, very limited information is available to allow full extraction and translation to clinical practice. The two posters we have looked at do align and further support the findings of the apricot randomised control trial. So reflecting back to the expert KOL statements in wound care, we can now see why they recommend they recommend a variety of publications which all intertwine. Here we have an example of a case series written up in a peer-reviewed journal. The article itself presents multiple case report data and showcases two of the case series in more depth. Again, of direct clinical relevance, expert practitioner and author, and they have used a formal case report data capture and sought approvals and consent to publish this work. The randomised control trial, case series and poster examples we have looked at are available to you, so please ask your local representative. Now let's look at how you can get involved and contribute to growing the clinical evidence base. A collaborative relationship between clinicians, academia and industry is highly important for furthering knowledge and advancements in clinical practice. Generating new clinical evidence. New clinical evidence is one of the many ways in which all clinicians can provide their feedback and experience in service or care delivery or new products and technologies. As mentioned earlier in this module, this can be through smaller scale case studies up to larger scale randomised control trials. Identifying clinical gaps or unmet needs. Clinical, clinical gaps and unmet needs help to identify areas in which logistic management or scientists can focus their innovative efforts towards providing potential solutions. Unmet needs are often identified through evaluating the current service delivery or available treatments, the disease burden or severity and patient population. Advance understanding and clinical positioning of new technologies. The best products in wound care, leg ulcer care, have been co-developed with clinicians and scientists. Voice of customer discussions provide insight for upcoming approaches to a speciality or products and technologies geared around at the rock face expert clinicians feedback. 
Through these engagements, there is potential to be hands-on with new guidelines, pathways, innovations and become research participants. Ultimately, support the underpinning of new policy, guidelines and educational materials. So how can you get involved? Many organisations offer a platform for expert practitioner membership, striving towards linking science, practitioner opinion, needs and academia. Millican Healthcare has recently launched a leader programme, designed to create a network of experts and influencers to help shape the future of treatment options and education in compression therapy and advanced wound care. The Thought Leader Programme aims to connect clinicians globally from both, from both practice and academia to industry. There will be opportunities to join programmes and projects and become an expert advisor for clinical portfolio pathway development. There will be participation in focus groups to provide input for clinical needs gap analysis, new product development, appraising brand messaging or current portfolio positioning. Educating industry on current speciality market and practice trends, keynote speaking events, conferences and workshops. These programmes also afford the opportunity to professionally network with global experts. If you are interested in becoming a member of the Thought Leader Programme, please ask your local Millican representative for a leaflet and instructions to register your interest. Resources and support. Throughout this module, I have stressed the importance of using formal data collection formats for all levels of evidence being undertaken. There is help out there for creating these with you and generic examples available. On the slide, you can see an example of a data collection form developed for a six week compression case series within the UK. Support and resources are available within many organisations and they can assist with data collection format, trade product and data collection, study initiation, study monitoring to validate the data, data analysis, data reporting, medical writing, presenting your evidence, publishing your evidence, linking to editors in key journals. Please ask for support if you are interested support if you are interested in undertaking some clinical data collection. Here you can see more examples of data collection form support. These are in-depth, bespoke or simple audit and appraisal forms which have been developed with clinicians for clinicians. Please ask for support if you are interested in undertaking any type of clinical work or are interested in registering your interest for membership of the Global Thought Leader Programme. To summarise, in this module we have explored the World Union of Wound Healing Society's Evidence in Wound Care Position Document, the history of evidence-based practice, how evidence is used in practice today, the hierarchy of evidence, the World Union of Wound Healing Society levels and a pyramid model, a journey from laboratory to randomised control trial, appraising the literature and translating to clinical practice. Examples of studies, their design, advantages and limitations. How you can become involved. Projects, programmes and memberships that are available and access to resources and support to conduct clinical work. Thank you for completing Module 6, Clinical Evidence and Evaluations. This is the final module in the Millican Healthcare Compression Training Academy series. If you have not completed all six modules, you will be able to access the previous modules via the Healthcare Representative. 
The additional five modules in the Compression Academy series are Module 1, Leg Ulcers and Conditions Affecting the Lower Limb. This module explores lower limb physiology, assessment, investigation and venous leg ulcer differential diagnosis. Module 2, Understanding Compression Therapy. This module explores how compression works, the theory and science of compression, compression types, characteristics of ideal compression, selection of compression and patient benefits. Module 3, com- module three Compression Therapy in Practice. This module explores and compares various bandage materials, application methods, ease of use, ease of training, patient safety and competency, how to correctly apply, how to achieve and sustain desired levels of compression. This module includes compression frequently asked questions and a training competency framework example. Module 4, Wound Management Principles with Compression. This explores best practice of skin care, wound care, exudate management and infection management or prevention strategies combined with compression therapy. Module 5, Supports Home Care Practice, Patient Information and Patient Care Advice Materials for Looking After Compression at Home. Preventing recurrence, skin management, diet, exercise and and compression hosiery.